Welcome back friends, my name is Brian and I am back in the garage again today. If you happen to own a single cylinder, air-cooled, overhead valve, a Honda, like you might find in a CT70, SL70, or maybe like an ATC70, this is the video for you if you wanna adjust your points. So I'm gonna go over four different techniques for adjusting points, and frankly, these are the only four techniques about which I am aware. So I don't know of any other way of doing it. Couple other things. One is, if you know the procedure that you want to use for adjusting your points, you can look in the description box below and I have some timestamps in there so you can jump around this video and go the procedure that kind of fits your needs. In addition to that, I have links in the description box for all the tools that I'm gonna use in this video. So if you're uh, wanting to buy some of the things that you see, the tools, I'll have links for those in the description box below. So that's about it. Let's pick up some tools and go to work. All right, so let's go over the method by which the points opening or gap is adjusted. To service the points, first remove this ignition plate cover. Remove these two bolts in order to first remove the chain guard. Start by slightly loosening the points base plate locking screw. Then, when you want to adjust the position of the points, use a flathead screwdriver and insert it into the purpose-built adjustment notch. Then you can rotate the screwdriver tip up or down until the points are in the correct position. Once the point position has been adjusted, you can check the points gap using a 0.3 or 0.4 millimeter size feeler gauge, which I'll go over in a little bit more detail in just a minute. All right, so now you've seen how the uh, points gap is adjusted. When I come back, I'm gonna show you four ways to set the point timing, so be right back. Okay, the first method I call the static method. Rotate the flywheel counterclockwise until the T mark is aligned with a timing notch in the engine case. I mark the T with a piece of red tape. Loosen the base plate locking screw. Then with the T line, as you saw earlier, rotate the point space with the flat head until the gap between the points appears to be at its widest. Now try sliding a minimum 0.3 or 0.4 millimeter feeler gauge between the points. If the feeler gauge won't pass through, have another go up with a flat head and rotate the points up or down to widen the gap. Then try again with the feeler gauge. It may take a bit of trial and error, but provided the points foot is not worn out, the feeler gauge should eventually pass through the gap. Once set, snug the base plate locking screw. To me, one of the best things about the static method is that it works. So that's important. You need to be able to at least get your motor to fire and using this technique, you should be able to. Also, it's very cheap. You only need a couple of tools and a feeler gauge to do this method, so that's a big benefit too if money is a concern for you. And finally, to me, one of the best things about it is that it's very simple. It's the simplest way. You don't need a lot of tools. It's a very simple procedure. So as far as ways to do the point setting, this has to be the easiest. Now on the con side, to me, one of the most difficult parts of recommending this is that it is not accurate. And to me, you're gonna see why in just a second. The next technique I call the Honda method. This is the recommended technique in the Honda factory service manual and it employs a light that dims with a loss of continuity. Access to this black wire and the four prong plug that is usually tucked inside the chassis is required. And unfortunately, that requires removing a lot of stuff. Drain the fuel, remove the intake track and the air box. Then finally, you can have access to the four prong plug. After that, the chain guard and ignition cover need to be removed. There are several electrical connections to make using this Honda method. Start by removing the 10A fuse at the battery. Expose the red positive terminal lead. Connect a jumper wire to the positive side of the battery. Next, access the battery ground lead, which on this battery is blue, and connect a jumper wire to the ground. I didn't have a blue jumper wire, so I'm using a white wire instead. Next are the connections near the generator. To make this easier to see, I'm locating a piece of yellow electrical tape on the F mark of the flywheel. Look for this black wire in the connector. This is the male end of a four plug connector that originates from the engine, not the central wiring harness inside the chassis. Connect a jumper wire to the male connector that attaches to this black wire. For my continuity light, I'm using a turn signal from a Honda CT70. It has a power lead here. If you don't have a bulb in a housing like this, you could connect a wire to the electrical foot of a six volt bulb and a ground to the side of the bayonet cap.
So connect the power lead of the light to the jumper wire that originates from the positive battery terminal. Next, connect the jumper that originates from the four prong connector to the ground side of the continuity light. To complete the circuit, connect the jumper lead from the negative battery terminal to a chassis ground like this engine mount bolt, and sorry about my arm being in the way. The uh, continuity light then turns on. The ideal setting is achieved when the continuity light dims just as the F mark aligns with the timing notch on the crankcase. This motor starts and runs, but notice how far away from the timing notch the F mark is in the flywheel. This is the result of using the static method I demonstrated earlier. Now this is quite a big gap and it's far from the ideal point setting, so further adjusting is going to be needed. Again, start by slightly loosening the point's base plate locking screw. Then with a flathead screwdriver, rotate the base plate. Then test the setting. Don't be surprised if it takes a bit of trial and error to dial the setting in. This is the ideal setting, as the continuity light just starts to dim when the F mark is aligned with the timing notch in the case. And once dialed in, tighten the points base plate with the Phillips screwdriver and you're done. To further check your settings and ensure that your points are within wear limits, measure the point gap at the T mark on the flywheel. I'm adding red electrical tape over the T mark to make it a little bit easier to see. Align the T mark with the timing mark on the crankcase. Then, with a 0.3 or 0.4 millimeter feeler gauge, confirm the minimum points gap by passing the feeler gauge between the contacts. All right, so let's go over the Honda service manual method pros and cons. So on the pro side, one of the things I really like about this technique is that Honda recommends it. This is the method that Honda recommends in the service manual and I tend to not want to go against anything that the service manual says or at least most of the time I don't. So that's one major plus. Another one is that this is fairly easy to do. All you need is a six volt a light bulb and a couple of wires and you can basically repeat this test very simply. In addition to that, if you're an engine builder, uh, you can do this test with the engine out of the chassis, which to me is a big plus. Uh, if you're an engine builder, you don't want to build up a rig basically to run your motors in. You just want to build them and send them out and you don't want to start them up and do all that. This is a good thing for a guy like you that's doing something like that. Now on the downside, on the con side, to me one of the biggest cons of this particular system is that if the engine is in the bike, you have to take off a lot of parts. You saw in the video, but you know, the car, the, the uh, intake, the air box, I mean, everything basically is coming off so you can access the plug for this thing. So it's a lot of work basically. And the thing I really don't like about that is that let's just say that, you know, you lose the setting somehow, you know, on your, on your points, it starts to not work right. And you got to reset it. You got to take all those parts off again. So it's a lot of work. So that's basically how I feel about the, the Honda system. So let's go on to the next. The next method consists of using an ohm meter to check the continuity by connecting it to a coil wire lead. On some bikes, to get to this lead, you may have to remove the battery and possibly the gas tank. Locate the black wire with the white stripe. If you had to take your tank out to access the coil wire, drop the battery back in for now. Reconnect the 4-pin connector, then insert one of the meter leads into the female connector. Set the meter to the continuity check, this symbol here. Then ground the other lead to something like this motor mount, and then knock the meter over. <laughs> Slowly rotate the flywheel counterclockwise, and when the points open, you should hear an interruption in the continuity tones like this. All right, so let's talk about the pros and cons of the continuity method. So on the pro side, to me, this, like the Honda method, has the benefit of being able to perform the test with the motor out of the chassis. So that's a plus. To me, that's a great, like if you're an engine builder, you don't want to build a test uh, rig to run your motors on. You just want to test them in a static fashion. You can use this technique out of the bike, and that, to me, is a big plus. You do have to have an ohm meter, which kind of falls onto the con side because it's an expense and that's something you don't want to have to necessarily buy, but that's another negative. In addition to that, I found this to be a very tricky test to repeat, and I just want to go over that just a little bit. So I found that it was very dependent on turning the flywheel very slowly to get that little tone interruption that you're looking for. So to me, I didn't like that part of it and it made it a really, really difficult thing to repeat. So 
I didn't really care for that. And in addition to that, there's one other thing I didn't really like, and that's if, you're, if your coil lead is like in your chassis and you have to pull out your gas tank and all the stuff that you saw in this video, that to me is a negative also. So there you go, the pros and cons of the continuity method. All right, the final method utilizes a timing light. To use this method, you'll need a 12 volt power source, and I'm using this portable jump start pack, but you can use something like a car battery as your power source. And of course, you're gonna need a timing light. If you've never used a timing light, let me briefly explain how to use one. There are two leads that you connect to your 12 volt power supply. The red connects to the positive terminal, and the black one connects to the negative. This is a coil which is located somewhere on your bike, and from that coil runs the spark plug lead. And somewhere along the spark plug wire, the timing light pickup is fitted like this. Connect the positive and negative leads to the 12 volt power source. Not all timing lights have an advanced adjuster, but if yours does, set it to zero. Start the motor, then aim the light at the crankcase timing mark and pull the trigger on the timing gun. The timing light is a strobe that's energized every time the power travels down the spark plug wire. And you can see the rotation of the flywheel is counterclockwise. I haven't changed the point setting, but using this technique, the timing shows to be slightly retarded, meaning that the power from the spark plug wire is being released just a fraction after the ideal firing moment. All right, so let's talk about the pros and cons of the timing light. So, on the pro side, one of the things I really like about this test, it is the least complicated. So there's almost no parts to remove. In fact, all you have to take off is the ignition cover. That's really it. So to me, that is a major positive. Another thing too, because the engine is running, this is a dynamic test instead of a static test. So because of that, the results are extremely accurate. The motor is running, so you're getting the actual spark showing you exactly when that's firing using this timing light. So highly accurate. On the downside, of course, you have to have a timing light. So that's an expense. So if you don't have a timing light, you will have to buy one. And on the same note, in terms of expense, if you don't have a 12 volt battery source, you're gonna have to find one of those. So I have the little battery pack, but if you don't have that, you might have to pull your battery out of a car, or maybe another you know, more modern motorcycle with a, with a 12 volt power system. So those are the uh, downsides and the pros, basically, of the, uh, of the timing light system. And a couple parting thoughts. So I wanna tell you, first of all, I never changed the setting on this motor after I used the Honda system, which was the light bulb system. I never changed it, and I found it extremely interesting that I got different readings using every single system. So even though the points never changed, I still got different readings, and I found that to be highly suspicious and highly odd, and something maybe you might want to take note of. But one thing about that, that just kind of following on from that, is that these motors are pretty low horsepower, so you can have a pretty significant variance in the timing or the points opening, and still have a, a motor that runs well. As you saw, my original static setting was a significantly retarded setting, retarded in like the advanced and retarded, not retarded like it's stupid, but I mean retarded setting, so it still ran. I mean, it was way out of spec, but it still ran just fine. So these motors are not high strung race bikes or anything like that. They're gonna work just fine. So a couple of the things I wanna say. One is I wanna give a big shout out to a good friend of mine, Troy Fredrickson, and he's an electrician by trade, and Troy has helped me immensely on these videos that I've done with electrical things. He is amazing, and he does a lot of CT70 work. I don't think I could have built my CT70 without Troy's help, so a big thanks to Troy. And if you ever need any kind of CT work done, he is your man. He is an engine maven and an electronic genius, so super big thanks to Troy. And I guess that's really pretty much all I have to say. So thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you taking the time to watch my videos. I love to pay it forward and share my knowledge and Troy's knowledge with the people that watch. So I really appreciate you taking the time to watch these videos. Now, get out there in your garage, go outside, make sure to have fun.